I'll start with Andrew Cox, retired master gunnery sergeant, thelostart.podbean.com. Get some merchandise and help support the podcast in getting our veteran voices out for all to hear. Now on all major podcast platforms, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Be a guest, tell your veteran story, discuss your veteran business or organization. Email the lost art with Andrew Cox at gmail.com. Andrew Cox, a Till Valhalla Project Ambassador. See the project story at tillvalhallaproject.com. Thanks for tuning in. Please enjoy the podcast that's giving a voice to our veterans. The Lost Art with Andrew Cox. Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Lost Art Podcast, that podcast giving a voice to our veterans. I'm your host, Andrew Cox. And today we're having a special guest who's going to tell his story. Uh, and we go back a little ways, a little ways, but we'll get to that here very shortly. Uh, if you're enjoying the podcast, go to the website, thelostart.podbean.com. Go check it out. There's a merchandise tab. You can click on that merchandise tab. Uh, get you some cool gear. Help support us and get our better voices out for all to hear. I also want to give a shout out to the Till Valhalla Project for allowing me to be an ambassador for their organization. They're doing some incredible things. Go to their website. Check it out. See what all they're doing. See if there's anything you can do to help them in their mission. That's tillvalhallaproject.com. Every, like every few five days. Somebody got hit wow. and my truck wasn't one of them. And I, at that time, I didn't think of it as God's work or, you know, God protected me or, you know, at that time, because I wasn't too heavy into believing in God at that time. I knew he was there, but every few days or so, you know, a truck would get hit or tank would get hit. And I never knew why, but then they started getting closer because next they were, they were like, the truck right in front of my truck would get hit and I would always get the back blast. Mm -hmm. And then there was one time we were on a steep hill. I mean, we had that long thing and we moved back and the tank went forward. So as it went forward, the tank blew up, but we were very like inches away from it and it knocked me out. And next thing, next thing, you know, I'm guarding a tank while they're fixing it. And I just see a lot of, People, Haji's just running around. I don't know what's going on. I don't know who to shoot. I didn't know what was going on. Wow. Yeah. And that wasn't the first actual experience of like combat. I think the first experience was when a truck did get blown up and we had to get off and uh, mind detect. Mm-hmm. I couldn't move. I was frozen. I was yeah. frozen because the stories I heard is there were IEDs everywhere. Mm-hmm. No matter what you saw. Like, there was a piece of phone, like a toy phone right there. And I was like, man, I don't know where to step. Because I heard that there's so many stories about yeah. taking wrong step. And then my first sergeant said, move, effing move, Hernandez. And I was like, I was like, took the step and I just took faith. And I went and swept what I needed to swept, you know, got where I needed to get out of the truck at that time. Yeah. And, you know, no one while I was in Afghanistan died. And I'm very grateful for that. I mean, a lot of people did lose limbs. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, I, you know, I was shot at, but I saw the 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 like the the bullets come off the glass because mm-hmm. you know the MRAPs were bulletproof. Yeah. And I, I think we were on not the MRAP, but the shorter one, like a Jeep looking one. Mm-hmm. And it was an experience out there that it you know doesn't compare to like you don't like. It's so hot, and then it, we went in the rainy season too. So mm. when I tried to take a piss or went to the restroom, I would jump and I would be knee deep in mud. I'm like, "Are you serious?" <laughs> like just yesterday it was hot, and then yeah. today it was flooded with mud. Wow. Yeah, and so I did. I guess I was in the combat zone for about six months, and I was getting tired. I was really getting tired, and they finally went ahead and switched me out. And this is how I know that God had his, I mean, God has his hand on everybody, but on me personally, this is when I figured out God had a hand on me because the day I got pulled out, I, they stuck me at some Bob. It was very nice. I can't remember what it was. It had a nice cafeteria, nice MWR. That day I went ahead and did my watch and I was controlling the radios and they went ahead and they've been wanting to dismount and clear because mm-hmm. they weren't allowed to. They were just allowed to just drive the trucks. Right. So this time they went ahead and took upon themselves 
they took a first sergeant of uh, a first lieutenant this time so i guess he wanted to do that so they went ahead and went and started clearing by foot mm. and i was on the radio and i was hearing screams and like i was hearing like call call like they were calling for help and i was like what's going on so they so one of my sergeants he went in and cleared the house and the car i was in went ahead and took the lead and went into a house to clear the gunner the one of the gunners stepped on the ied mm. blew both his legs off and then the second and third guy got strapped over the face and arms and you know the whole it was a four the four man crew and I t- and to this day, I was supposed to be on that. Wow. I was supposed to be on that. That, that was my truck I'm all, usually on. Yeah. And I'm thinking about, like, if I was on that day, I, I, it, my story could be way different. Yeah. My story could be way different. So I don't know. A lot changed me because before I went to Afghanistan, I was hoorah Marine. And then as soon as I got back, that's when, you know, I took everything as like I don't know why I'm here now. Like I'm, like I'm confused. Like, you know, why am I being treated like a baby now? Like it felt different, you know. Yeah. And I don't know if it was just the PTSD that was starting to kick in little by little, but like I was like, why are people telling me how to to raise a like a dog? And like I felt yeah. like everything was being under attack in me. Like when I when they found out that I met my wife. They were like, oh, are you sure she's the right one? Like, I just felt like being attacked. Yeah. And then in my, my like motivation kind of went down until I got married. And then, then it went, it, it went back up. But then that's when it was already too late. I was like, man, I was already overweight. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, I mean, I might as well just get out, you know? Yeah. But I mean, when I was in Afghanistan, it was, it was, it was an experience that, you don't want to take the granted, you know, yeah. because there was so many times where I could have, I could have, you know, died, you know, yeah. I mean, it, or it could have been my, I could have been on that, that watch or that, that route. Mm-hmm. And I, am like I said, when I said I didn't lose anybody, it was after, after war when I lost a lot of friends. Yeah. I lost two, two or three friends from uh, suicide. Mm. And then the day we got back, the next day, we lost a uh, we lost another guy from Motor T. He was driving down um, the main highway going to Palm Springs. Mm-hmm. Got clipped by eighteen wheeler and died. And it just went like it was just like kind of like final destination. Yeah. And I told my wife, I, I said that's it's the way that it feels is like final destination. But I know it's not that. But the last one that kind of kind of got me off guard was this guy named Copa Rojo. He, I don't know, he was in California, and I think it was a rollover crash. He went to go try to save the people in the car, and they ended up running into him, too. Oh, wow. And he died. And I was like, I was like, you know, I said, war does a lot of things to people. And... There's a lot of things that I hide, and my wife knows about it. She's like, you know, the things you do and say, it doesn't make sense sometimes. She goes, that's how I know something's wrong. But as a man, you're like, nothing's wrong. I mean, yeah. you know, but, you know, your wife knows or your family. And so when I got back from Afghanistan, I became more of an alcoholic, worse. Mm-hmm. And then that's when I met my wife. and. You know, when I met her, I went because I went home one day and that's when she was like, you got to put down the bottle or no more. And I was like, you know, I mean, I didn't want to lose her. I was like, because I'll be, you know, God sent me to you at that time. Yeah. You know, God sent me you to me for a reason. So I went ahead and put the bottle down. And since then, I haven't touched it. You know, Wow. I mean, I. No, actually, I don't. I don't get drunk. No, I don't even drink, actually. And, you know, I did struggle with it for a few times. Mm-hmm. And um, that's when, you know, I knew that, oh, man, she's the one. She can make me stop drinking. Yeah. Because my whole line of family, they were out, you know, they drank a lot. Yeah. And so, you know, 
I wasn't too much until after Afghanistan. That's when I was hitting the bottle a lot. Yeah. Clubs, you know, and then now I think about it, I'm like, what if I would have done things different? Like I saw some of my, well, a couple of my friends, they were going to college in the military. Like I should have done stuff. Like I, I think about that. Like, man, I should have done what he did. He went to college. Mm -hmm. Like he went, he would go to work and go straight to the college, the whatever that twenty nine. Yeah. And then not, no, nope, not me. I was going over there and as soon as Friday hit, hey, let's go to Vegas, boys. Let's go to San Diego. Let's go to LA. And now I regret it because I don't have nothing to show for it, you know? Yeah. But my wife may realize that if I would have done that, I would probably would never met her, you know? Yeah. Everything would have been completely different. And, you know, ever since then, we were still, you know, we were struggling to like get on like a religious track because we were both Catholic. So we were just trained to, as a kid, hey, you're Catholic, you're nothing else. Yeah. You know, we were always trained that way. And we just, one day, I guess she started losing family members. Like, and it, it was sad. Like, she lost her sister, lost her dad. And it, it just back to back to back. And I guess we just gave up. We threw our hands up and we're like, we just go to church, a different church, right? And that's when we found Christian church. We just haven't turned back since. And it's been awesome. We just feel his blessings and everything we do. And we're confused a lot. Like, well, why would he do this? Why would he do that? But just that's where we hit our knees and pray. And yeah. Talk to him. Now, so after you got out of uh, in 29 Palms, came to tech, back to Texas? Came back to yeah. Texas and my first job i think i was with the fiberglass company i loved it i loved it and i don't know if it was separation anxiety from my wife or i don't know if it was just the boredom got to the work i was there for a year and a half and i don't know i just walked out because i was starting to feel like i was being attacked again by the the owners or whatever who are the managers and so i love that job i was like man but I burned that bridge. And then I went to a couple other places. But the next job that I loved was uh, Amazon. I was there for almost four years. And uh, I quickly rose from $10 an hour to like $26 an hour. Nice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I loved it. I mean, I was, I was the top of my game at that time. And I don't know what happened. There was just a switch towards the end of the three-year mark. And my wife started noticing a lot of things, gradual things. So that's when, you know, she started going to school to make up, like, well, let me go to school so we can try to, I can try to, you know, let you rest for a little bit. So she went to school, and then that's when I started going to school and working. And so it just, I was just getting so overwhelmed, I guess. And I was confused, and I just felt like I was starting to get that boredom at work again. And I don't know if it was boredom or I don't know if it was, I don't know, I, I guess, I don't know, something veterans can't explain. But Amazon was, that was my favorite job in the world. And I don't know why it ended, but after that, it was just a gradual, yeah. gradual, everything, like job after job. Ikea, I mean, I went. I was so confused. I was even a car salesman. Yeah. I used to, I've never sold nothing in my life. And I was a car salesman. That lasted a month. And <laughs> then I went to, I went to um, Ikea and I was there for about six months. And then the last job that I got, I think that was the tipping scale to where I had, I just went to the VA and I cried for help because I was a hall monitor. But it, it was weird because I liked it. But I don't know why I was there. I, maybe because I gave me a little bit of a little authority, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. But, I mean, I still connected with kids. I noticed that. I was, I was there. I was connecting with the kids. And I told my wife, I don't know what it is about being a mom or But I just connect with the kids. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. And it's the kids that. The kids I was as I was a kid, mm -hmm. you know. Of kids that didn't have a dad and mom there either 
Yeah. Because that's what I was noticing. Mm -hmm. I was more connected to them. And I would always ask them, how, how's their day? How's, you know, are y'all okay? I mean, if y'all need anything, y'all just come to me. And I was just a homeowner. And that's when I just, I don't know. I don't know what happened. Something clicked. And I just went to the VA and I needed help. And I was like, I, I mean, I got the help I needed. And ever since then, I just, I guess I just, I am told my wife, I said, I don't know what to do anymore. I said, I don't, I feel like I'm in so much pain everywhere. Like I get back spasms and they get, they're getting worse. And mm -hmm. I said, I don't know what I have to do. I said, I'm just going to take a break and just, I need to figure out and focus on my health. And so ever since then, I haven't worked and God's been providing, you know, I don't know how, but he has been, uh, you know, cause she doesn't, I don't want her to work because of her diabetes and her, mm -hmm. her situation. but. It's something that we're trying to discover together, you know, like yeah. what are, what's next for us. Right. And that's when we started getting kids involved. Like kids and there are people who have been like, Hey, you want to take a kid and they need help. You know, mm -hmm. I already had two of them, you know, that are mine. Yeah. And so we're like, yeah, I mean, I mean, we're not gonna say no. Like I don't wanna what they've been through, you know, there was this set of kids that they were They were molested, um, you know. Yeah. So they were her family, and we wanted to take them in. You know, we're like, well, I me, mean, I don't want them to go any into a foster care system because yeah. they're family, you know. And I feel like that's what God put us here for. So we took them in, and we showed them as much love as we could, you know. But you cannot connect to somebody that's not your daughter or son. So it was hard. It got hard, and it got hard with my kids because you know, they have to give up their mom and dad for a little bit, you mm -hmm. know. And so we try to be as we try to be as, you know, loving to every single one of our, you know, them and our kids at the same time. And we're just like, okay, when your parents, one of your parents gets off, gets out of prison or the yeah, other, you guys will return, you know, we'll return yeah. them, but we'll make sure that they're safe. Yeah. And we, they checked out and we're like, okay, yeah, I mean, we feel like you, this is y'all need because they were growing up to, I think one was a six year old and one was a 12 year old. So they were getting those feelings like, mm -hmm. yeah. And there was something that we couldn't feel. We couldn't, we couldn't give them that, that mom and dad love. Yeah. And so when the dads, get, both dads got out of uh, prison, they both went to yeah. their dads. They had the same mom, but the mom was still in prison. Yeah. So, and, you know, we check on them from time to time, and they're, they're okay. I mean, they miss us, but, yeah. you, know, you know, they only know what they know, you know, yeah. that yeah. their mom's in prison and that their dad's. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Now, you were telling me uh, earlier about your uh, oldest daughter. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so, 2013, I had my oldest daughter, Paris. Um, we were supposed to have her February 14th or around Valentine's Day. Um, she became because my wife is diabetic, so you know, her, I guess her cycle it kind of it messes with her. So we ended up having my daughter on Christmas Day in 2013, way earlier. Mm -hmm. She was supposed to be born on the February 14, 2014. So she became with a preemie, so she stayed in the NICU for 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 like a month or so, and they released her. And so, yeah, we, you know, we had a, we had my first baby girl and the day around the time she was supposed to be born in February, 2014, I was at work. They rushed to the hospital. Mm -hmm. My sister, my wife and my sister-in-law rushed to the hospital. And I didn't find out until two hours later because they couldn't get a hold of me at work that my daughter had passed, but they were trying to revive her in San Antonio. So I hurry up and I rushed, I rushed and rushed to San Antonio when I found out that she was in ICU. And the doctors, all the doctors were around us like, you guys can start uh, planning for her funeral. And I was devastated. I was like, wow. I was like, I, I was like in shock. Like, we just had her. Like, it just don't make sense. Mm -hmm. And so 
couple of days later, we we're just holding out. We we're just holding out to make sure, you know, there was nothing that will come to like help with anything. Like, so they, you know, they trans, they did the transfusion and it, it might have worked. I don't know. But then uh, one day we were there. Well, I wasn't there actually. My wife was in the room with her sister and another nurse. A doctor came in from Iraq or uh, some other country. He came in and he said, this is all wrong. Take those out. Take that out. Put that machine there. Put that on. Hook that up. And he was just yelling at the nurses. And they did it. And then uh, maybe a few hours later, she was better. Like They are like, oh, I don't know what happened. It was like a miraculous miracle. It was, I was, when I found out, I was like, well, who was the doctor? She was like, I don't know. She said, I asked everybody in the, all the nurses on the floor, they were like, he just came in for one day. Wow. He came in for one day and he gave orders and then he left. And they, we kept trying to find out who the doctor was. And there's, they said it was like one of those doctors that passed through the night and he, did what he did, and that I, that was a miracle from God because my baby was supposed to be six feet under soon. Yeah, and now she's walking around, and she's she's a work of art. <laughs> she's got a. She's what ten? She's uh ten right now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and she's fifth grader now. She started school today. Yeah. Then a couple of years passed, and then we had my my other my youngest, Adrielissa. It's Adrian, my middle name, and Melissa put together. Oh, nice. And, and, you know, she's a little fire. Yeah. They're, they're completely different. And you know what? They were, these, these uh, my two girls are miracle babies because we were told that my wife couldn't have no kids. Yeah. Here and in California. We were yeah. on base and we tried to conceive and they told us straight up, you can't have babies. Wow. And so when we got back to Texas after the Marines, Mm -hmm. that's when we we started we we popped two out and yeah you know it's been it's been a ride man. it's been a ride and well it, i mean i obviously you know uh uh god and everything has been a huge impact on your life right yes uh and i i noticed you were uh like on uh what's it called facebook you get on and you do uh like devotionals and stuff like that uh so is that something that you're trying to push for? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, I try to stay on top of that. But, you know, I'm like a normal person. The devil yeah. gets to me, too. I get that lazy demon in me, and I'm like, uh, and I'll go a day or two without it. And my wife's there to push me. Like, yeah. hey, get on the devotional. Get on that life. My brother-in-law's there to push me. Yeah. You know, um, those are two people that I'm very proud of. My brother-in-law and my wife. Yeah. You know, because my brother-in-law, he kicked addictions mm -hmm. and i've seen it firsthand where he was in and out of rehabs then he turned to god and i've seen how that worked mm -hmm. like he is at amazon mm -hmm. and he's the man that i was like wow i never thought he would kick addiction like that that's but awesome because he, he went through with god and now he's busting his butt at amazon yeah the job that i love so much and i love it because i love to see him mm -hmm. that's somebody i would want to see at that job if yeah ever, you know and you know my wife she's she's everything to me i mean i mean your wife's everything to you right yeah, absolutely and so i try to do the diets with her i i do fail a lot i mean <laughs> i mean i i try i try to juice i try to stay on zero sugar it's hard for me but you know it's sad to see her when she gets in an emotional state that she can only see one eye you know, mm -hmm. out of one eye right now. Right. But she doesn't give up. She she has faith that it, it's going to heal. And we yeah. have faith. And the daily devotionals, I'm trying my hardest to push it out because it's crazy how it works. Like, I was on a devotional one day and I was on a live. And this guy popped up. He goes, hey, you remember me? And I was like, no. Who are you? <laughs> I said, B can. I was like, B can. Why does that sound familiar? Can. I looked and looked. He goes, I was your recruiter. I was like, no way. <laughs> no way. I said, there's no way. I said, can too? He goes, yeah, from New Braunfels? He goes, yes. He goes, I moved back to Texas, and 
I was just on TikTok and you popped up. Yeah. I was like, you know how long I've been looking for you? <laughs> I said, I've been looking for you forever to tell you thank you. That's I wild. said, so now, I mean, he's like, he's on my devotionals. And I know we're supposed to meet up one day uh, in a couple weeks or a month or so to, to have lunch. But he was the guy who got me into yeah. the Marine Corps. Yeah. And that was just, you know, that was all, like, I'm telling you, it's full circle how everything's going. And then he, I just get random people on on TikTok and Facebook, like, man, I was fishing one day and your devotional popped up and you just, you lit up my day, dude. And I was like, thank you. I mean, it's not me. I'm just using the word of God to yeah. spread, you know? And I hear all my family members saying, you know, just, just saying that how it's it impactful to them. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, it's nothing I'm doing. I said, I'm just reading from the word of God. And I'm just trying to spread his, his message to everybody. Yeah. And my wife does the same thing. And, you know, we've changed a lot. We've grown in Christ. And we just, we just, I don't know, we just try to live for him, you know? Yeah. And yeah. do what he wants. And we try to speak and try to hear to what's next. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, full circle. I mean, I was looking for you, Thompson, and Gomez for the longest, even yeah. when I was in the Marine Corps. And then I run in, I run into you, you know, Yeah. 15 years later, just to say, thank you. <laughs> no problem, man. Shoot. I'm, I'm proud of you. Thank you. you. You know, got Got a good family, you know, good godly man. That's awesome, man. Thank you. I like it. But thank, thanks for coming. Thank you. No, thank you. I mean, it was, it's been, it's been nice. Yeah. I know I you're in Texas for a little bit, but it's hot. Right? It is hot. It that is, hot. is true. Yeah. That, I, I was not prepared. I will say that, but, but it's okay. Yeah. I'm surviving it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Well, I have a visitor from North Carolina right now. He's like, man, it don't get past 87 over here. I mean, over there. And yeah. I was like, man. Yeah. It's, it's been at close to a hundred almost every day. Yeah. Yeah. But right now my wife's trying to, trying to go to school. She's looking yeah. for a school. She's trying to see what God's trying to tell her to do. Yeah. I think it might be teaching kids. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think our whole life it, from now on is have to do with kids. Yeah. Because the kid, something has us drawn to some kind of form of teaching kids, and it's crazy. Yeah. We just got to figure it out, right? Yeah, it'll come. You know. Yeah. When you least expect it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Hey, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing your story. Uh, very impactful story. Uh, and good on you to recognize. Hey, it's time to get get help or to stop drinking and and those types of things. Uh, and of course, it's always great to have your woman by your side to to let you know whenever stuff like that is is uh, needed. Uh, but good for you and what you're doing, man. Appreciate yeah. it. So, thank you. Yeah, like I said, she was a big role in noticing signs. Yeah, and I just don't want nobody to be like, oh, you know, I don't want nobody to realize that that your spouse could notice the signs oh yeah because yeah. it was impactful to me yeah absolutely and then how long have you guys been married now uh we've been married since 2012 so almost 12 years 12 years, years. yeah Dang. that's awesome yeah. well congratulations to both of you thanks for coming on uh to all the listeners out there if you're struggling you need help anything like that don't forget the va does have great resources you can always dial 988 Press option one. You could text 838-255 or you can go to veteranscrisisline.net. Click on that chat icon. Any of those options are going to put you in contact with somebody that help you out. Remember, one veteran life loss is one too many. I care about you. I know this guy cares about you. The whole veteran community cares about you. So please reach out for help. With that, thanks one last time for coming on. To all the listeners, stay motivated. Change your socks.